Yo, what's up guys? Wanted to check out some things relating to mix and kicks in house music. And basically these these techniques apply to pretty much any genre, so it's not it's not really genre specific. This can be used in anything. These days I work a lot with house. I mix and master house. I work with artists like John Summit and um I've done stuff for labels like Defected, Repopulate Mars, Armada Music. I've mastered music by Octa Octa, um, Luke Vibert, and so on. So I love house. I like I love working with it. I wanted to be talking about mixing kick and um, mixing a kick in a song and basically the things that I do most often. I have a house loop here. Let's just loop that. So I want to go through the the things that I do most often to most kicks that I mix. Let, let me flick off on and off this EQ that I have here. There's a bit of latency because there's processing in the song. I've removed some of the parts. The song isn't out yet, so I don't want to. I don't want you to hear the whole song. But let's listen to the kick for now. Let me flick off. I don't know if the, the EQ here. So let me start here. I always start with low mids usually. I get at first I get the level right, and then I usually listen to the kick and what's wrong with it. And most kicks have a little bit too much low mid energy here. Let me flick all of these EQ nodes on and off. So this range, let's talk about this range. Some of the kicks that I get sound like this. And then they take a lot of space in the mix. Let me play this with the bass. So what I usually do is this let me create another version so what I do is this I usually go for 18 dB boosts I'm kind of fixed although I don't often like to teach numbers for whatever reason wait 18 dB boost is I found is great for scanning for this low mid congestion so I find the spots that start to kind of whistle and break up It's often roughly between 120 and 150 hertz where the excess low mid weight is. So I find the spots This is definitely not it isn't the craziest, most problematic kick I've ever heard, but I can I can guarantee this technique can be used to any kick in the world. And most kicks do have a little bit of excess low mid energy in them. If you think about a kick as a sine wave, basically it pitch its pitch leaps up and then it comes down. So it, this, some of the energy just builds up too much in the low mids. So what I do is this I 18 dB boost narrow scan and then you this is where you kind of just make the kick classy enough i'm not lying when i say that i've heard from my clients what did you do to my kick it's so it fits so well and this is often the thing that i do because low mids are really tricky to get right if your acoustics in the room are not great because it's always between around 120 150 that there's a lot of low mid build up in the sound of your room so getting this part right it's it's really tricky and that's my job to get it right um uh, by the way i never I hardly ever work with headphones unless i do a video i love the sound in my room 
I've heard music here for hundreds and hundreds of hours every year. So this technique is something I want you to want you guys to learn. There's other regions here and let's talk about them really soon. But this is one, this is, I always, I usually just start here. I don't look as much as I listen. But at that range, I want to get right. So usually when you make the kick classy enough in low mids, you then want to maybe add a little bit of weight. weight and uh, it's often in the subs that I then do a little push. Do take into account that if you do it broad like this, as you can see, it affects the low mid a little bit. I usually go as narrow as is is needed. Like I don't use I don't do like this when I boost the loads, the subs of the kick. I usually go something like this. I usually boost the sub range and find the lowest note. I don't have a number for this, just like because I don't want to stick to numbers too much. It's only the low mids that's really easy to kind of point out in terms of frequencies. That's the 120, 150 range. Let's flick, flick this on and off. So adding a little bit of weight, taking a little bit of, a little bit of low mid condition out. And obviously you have to, you want to mix the kick in relation to the bass. There's not crazy issues in this song because the bass is not super low. But then again, sometimes I get songs where the kick and bass occupy the same frequency range and they play at the same time. Then I usually do side chaining. But then let's see some other parts. This, The reason this kick is a good example, it's because it has a little bit of everything. It has a little bit of low mids. Uh, some lows that I can boost and also it has some highs and mids. So let me flick this off. Let's talk about this mid range here. Let me solo on this EQ node. Let me go crazy with this so you can hear. So this is like the BAM. If, if I if I would try to describe these frequencies, it's like low mids, it's like, it's most, I guess this is kind of hard. It's like, oof, oof. And then the sub is like, oof. But this is more like BAM. So this is often like the, the, the character, the body of the kick in a way that is like, this is like the really audible part in a way. Let me flick this on and off. So I often do this like a bell boost around 100, uh, 50, 100 and, and 2K, somewhere there. So this is like the third part of the kick in mixing the kick. Like get use this guy to sort of make the kick nicely cut through the mix in terms of its like the mid body. You have the weight here in, in the subs, and then you make make it light enough here, make it audible enough in the mids. And also, if you want to get a little bit of highs and mids, then I usually just try and do this because l listen to the highs of the kick. This is it's a great example because, like I said, it has a little bit of everything. Let's listen to this high part of the kick. Whoops, sorry, messing. So this is also useful. So if you want a little bit of mids and highs, then I usually do this and I don't get like super crazy particular with it. It's like the, the bam part.
but sometimes if I only want to boost like the spikiness of the kick and obviously for that you're going to need some high frequencies like this kick has then I may do this like I do this high shelf and it's kind of steep let's listen to what I can do with this what I do is I I start from here this is a little too high but then I start bringing it down and listen to what happens. It is probably too much, I know, but I want you to hear. Like here, I'm not touching the BAM part. This is more like, kind of like if you have a clicky kick, the click is, well, it's kind of, wide anyways but you know you get my point this is like the and this kind of helps it's like a kind of like a white noise somewhere in the highs once again you would mix it in the context of the song It's good to do this in solo so you understand what parts you're touching. Sometimes the little boost that you in solo you don't hear in the context of the mix. So it's always like the good tip is to mix it in context. Like if, if you want to boost a part so that it's heard and it's audible, do it in the context of the mix. Like have everything playing. How much a part of a kick is supposed to be heard when the song is really crazy? or I mean crazy busy sorry so that's another matter but especially in the more minimal parts these little boosts are easier to hear and I get like I usually mix the uh, like the overall tone of the kick kind of I get pretty precise in the intro and outro because there it's more minimal and you can kind of just savor and and, and <laughs> enjoy the kick at the nuances and you can be like yeah man i made it sit so nice but obviously it has an importance uh it in the when it's really busy it depends on the song if you have a really busy song to be honest it's really hard to make a kick like crazy audible and this is something something i talk about with my clients every now and then and this also applies to things like vocals and vocal reverbs and small nuances in the mix if you have a really busy song it's really it's it's more difficult to get really just kind of <laughs> kind of precious about small things but if you have a more minimal song it's especially then that l these things matter way more you will notice this in the intro and outro of the song because they're it's there that you can just kind of get really meticulous with the little things. So recap. It's mostly like four parts in the kick that I get um, particular about. So low mids, I usually start here I because most kicks need it every single kick can you use a little bit of this this is also one thing about this there are times when you don't want to necessarily cut it obviously there are perfect kicks that no, don't need this you can also use this range to sort of push the like the punch of the kick especially this has to be done in context like the song has to be playing and you have to have the bass line there because I mean when you when you really want to get get it right in terms of like how the kick cut, cuts through, through the mix it has to be in context but sometimes and I also do this in mastering by the way sometimes I scan this low mids and it, you can find the spot where you can kind of help the punch of the kick a little bit and it's there that this low mid region can actually help could be here with Pro Q3 you could do the this dynamic so sometimes in mastering if the client asks me to get the kick up 
you know, in, in if you do a mastering from just from the pre master, it is more tricky. Sometimes I get stems, sometimes I have to ask for stems. But in mastering, this can help like you find this kick range, and you do a little boost there. Don't go go for the sub in mastering because your base will be there. But this can help with punch. So recap, massage the low mids, take the extra clutter out. Then you can add a little bit of weight. It gets classier and weightier. You take the, is the oof, oof, of the kick. So I know it sounds stupid, but that's the that's the part here. Subs. And this is more like the bam part. If you want to get a bit of like mids and highs, you do this. But I really, with some kicks, I want to get kind of meticulous and I get the high, a little touch of highs, I get it here. And a quick word about side chaining. Let me just, I've kind of mutilated this kick, I know, but this has been for just for the sake of demonstrating. So every every mix, even if there's not crazy clashing, I do this side chain thing. So here, let me play this. So the red part here is the kick. I'm seeing the frequencies of the kick in the uh, EQ. And in Ableton Live, the sidechain drop down menu, I just choose kick and that's it. So as you can see, the kick frequency comes kind of close to the kick, no, to the bass. So I usually just set it here. I, I find I find the lowest frequency of the kick. Like I literally, I look here and I set this EQ note, EQ note here. And activating the side chain is here. This is the uh, this is the icon that activates side chain. And dynamic part is this outer ring. And here you see you're basically here you're seeing the kick signal or the, the level of the kick. So this EQ node, the outer ring, is the dynamic one. So let me let me pull this threshold up here. Now it's not doing anything, as you can see. Like this is not pumping. But, but when I bring the threshold down, it, it means that because the kick level is here, you're bringing the threshold down so it starts to act based on the kick. And this outer ring, you can see dynamic range is like minus five and a half dB. So that's the maximum amount of cutting it can do. So on the baseline track here, where the kick hits, when the kick hits, it's doing around up to five and a half dB of cutting. So it it's reducing the clashing. You can also activate this icon here, which shows it's very subtle, but here is creating this red band that's indicating if you have some heavy clashing going on. You can even see it here. See here. So it's, it's showing you where it's clashing, but usually I just take a look because you can see here, you can see the, that's the lows of the kick. I don't side chain any other parts of the kick usually because the clashing usually just happens around the sub frequencies. But then I, on the even on the bass, I do, a, if it's needed, I do a bit of this. But mixing bass, that's, uh, I won't go there now. That's uh, another story. This video was about the kick. Oh, and one more thing I almost forgot. This is actually really useful and necessary to know, but it's not about EQing per se. Let me warp this track. So there have been countless times that I've been EQing a kick just like this, and it's just not fitting. And then pitching the kick has solved the problem like 100%. So if you feel that your kick is not sitting, try and pitch it. I could just, I could try and do it here. Let me just put. It 
really because I mean it obviously it has a massive effect on frequencies because especially because there's been so many times that I've tried to get the low mid right and it sounds not right like there's been times that I cannot make it heavy enough the EQ doesn't do it you can only use EQ to go so far in terms of fixing so these days it's like if I if I cannot make the kick sit in 10 minutes or so I try and pitch it there's been countless times that I've pitched a kick up or down. It's usually down. And I haven't told the producer at all. And they love the kick. I usually don't tell them. <laughs> but I, I can guarantee I, I do it to to make the kick. I mean, the, the mix benefits from that. So this is like your, not even necessarily your last tool. You can try it early on, but I'm just saying it. If you're mixing a kick and it just doesn't fit, this may be the reason. It's it it may be the frequencies or the pitch may be wrong. Try this as well. Also, I did post about my favorite kick beef inning, kick beef EQ on my Patreon recently. So take a look there. I won't go there now. And I'll show you one more thing which is because this is kind of common these days. Let's listen to this. What I'm doing here, listen to this. I'll, I'll flick this plugin off. So what I'm doing here is I'm shaving off some of the excess transient boost that's in the actual original kick. It's too, it's way too much, especially, especially there's a bit of mastery writing on. This is from a finished song, but I deleted all the other, other tracks for this video. Like the producer sent me a song that had a really fat kick, like really just kind of not super intrusive kick. But this kick is just too, it's too punchy. And it's, it's very common these days that producers use a transient designer or even a kick, kick designer where they can just make it really punchy and really sharp and it gets to EDM too quickly. So just want to say be mindful of the transient of the kick. If you if you don't want a really punchy transient sharp kick, I mean, I was happy with how round I was able to make this kick even just with this tool. Because a kick like this doesn't really benefit your song unless you want to go full EDM. And I mostly work with house and tech house and it, it, the kick usually doesn't have to sound like this. So I just wanted to bring this in quickly because this is one of the things I do if I get a kick that is too sharp. So if you have a kick that's too sharp and you have, if you want to make it softer, the spiff plugin is amazing for that. You can you can actually hear in Delta mode you can hear what what you're taking out. That is exactly what I want to take out of the kick. Especially like I said in the master processing there's a bit of brightening that the whole song needed. The song was well the mix needed some brightening and I usually on the mastering phase I try to get the like the even tone for everything. And it, especially the kick just after the brightening, this really got emphasized. So it's a good thing to have in your toolbox if you're mixing house kicks. So that is it for now. I hope this can benefit your mixing. If there is anything, feel free to ask. Till the next time, guys.